Great, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much, James, for inviting me. And uh, this is my first uh, trip to the annual meeting, and I hope it's not my last. I'm really impressed by it. Thank you. The, uh, the topic of the, uh, of the meeting is such that I have to uh, wonder why, uh, uh, what part of it I fulfill. I think I'm pretty much the uncertainty, actually, as I look at it. Uh, but I did notice that James uh, was suggesting that the uh, that one of the things that we're continually doing is looking at new models, changes in models, and that's what I'd like to present today. My, uh, some of my uh, co-authors are here, and uh, they will answer any of the particularly curly questions. And one of the ones who isn't here, I will show some of his work, Sam Roy, who, with his wife, is expecting a child momentarily. So uh, I, if we have questions, perhaps I'll cover those. Well. Uh, first of all, the motivation of the route map and uh, what uh, I'll be talking about. The uh, FIRM, which is the Failure Earth Response Model, is a model that we put together as a, uh, in response to concerns that uh, many of the, uh, of the existing process models were not capturing some of what I was uh, particularly interested in, and also uh, it was uh, not um, producing the, the kind of coupling between the geodynamics and the the theory of geodynamics and the, uh, the theory of the surface processes. So the two uh, main principles of this are first one, which I, I promise not to read the slides in general, but these I think are things which will be the center to what we're doing. And that is that the material uh, detachment, no matter what the stresses applied are, still uh, occurs as a function of the response to the stresses. So plastic failure or a uh, discontinuous process occurs as the, uh, as the material is stressed, and that uh, is independent of whether the stresses happen to be applied by uh, geomorphic processes or by uh, geodynamic or tectonic processes. Secondly, that the uh, large displacements affect the strain field, uh, the stress field, that is, the strain affects stress and it also affects the strength, and the strength field is going to be hugely important, and this gives us a predictability in much of what we're going to talk about, and a relationship in the topographic memory of the strain field, and it's a very important component of what we'll be doing, and I'll probably start out with that. So I'm really uh, particularly interested in using the uh, high frequency information that we have, that is the low frequency information, something I'll briefly go through, but we've been dealing with it for quite a few years now, and it's really time to move on to the tougher problems, I think. And uh, this is from the geodynamics. I think uh, the rest of you are dealing with high frequency stuff all the time. So I will start out by looking first at the strength and strain relationship. That is mostly uh, number two of this, uh, the failure earth response model firm. And then we'll take a look at how that couples to geodynamics and how it's predictable. And uh, then it, from there, we'll take a look at the introduction of the, an alternative formulation for surface dynamics that I hope we will develop in parallel with the existing one. Well, first of all, the, let's clarify the uh, kinds of uh, frequencies that we're talking about. The low frequency uh, behavior in geodynamics is something that we've been thrashing about for a long time, and it's the relationships really between long-term climates and uh, uh, convergent or extensional or strike-slip uh, tectonics, and they generally describe something like the Say this. Oh yeah. So that's not, if that pointer is offensive to anybody, let me know. I won't pay any attention to you, but you can let me know. Uh, this uh, uh, this is a cross section across the Himalaya from uh, India up into Tibet. It's a standard one. It's one of the early uh, kinds of cross sections that we modeled, and we model it often. And uh, there's very few geodynamics modelers who who haven't uh, brought this up. But the uh, all of this is. Uh, I think we're, we still have a great deal to learn with it, but it's also things that we can do relatively simply. What I'm more concerned with here, and in fact in most of my research and most of what we're doing, is looking at groups. I'm back. So maybe this isn't such a good idea with a pointer. Yeah. It's mostly looking at the very high frequency spatial uh, ridge valley relationships and uh, the high frequency spatial relationships are usually associated with high frequency temporal problems too. And I'm, so I'm interested predominantly in this talk of dealing not just with the gross uh, Himalaya and the Tibetan plateau, but also the small ridges and valleys and the 
the rapid fluctuation of those ridges and valleys uh, from time frames which exist at, um, uh, let's say, in the hundreds of years down to the milliseconds of seismic displacements. So I guess one of the reasons is why bother. And in fact, as I look at this talk, it's mostly about why bothering and what we're trying to produce. Uh, first of all, the modern solutions, uh, these are solutions, uh, the kinds that I'll refer to are done by uh, programs like Child and so on, do a fantastic job of representing the uh, long-term and sometimes short-term fluxes and climate uh, variations to the uh, sediment uh, that's being transferred. But one of the, um, the obvious problems and one that is, uh, I find, uh, personally uh, difficult to get over is that we look at the Earth in terms of different physics depending upon whether we're looking down on the Earth with surface dynamics or up at the Earth with geodynamics and I'm trying to bring those two together. In addition, the, uh, the properties of, that we use in much of the surface dynamics, surface dynamics are often difficult or impossible to measure, things like erodibility and so on are important parameters. Intuitively they make sense but they're very difficult to measure. But there are standard measurements of material properties that come from the engineering world, and those are ones that I would like to move into. And third, the kinds of advances that we're seeing, and many of them I think will be presented here, allow us to begin to look at the full 3D stress field and rapidly fluctuating and slowly fluctuating. And so the concept that we deal only with principal stresses and so on is something that we can now move away from and move on to something new. Another reason is because there are a number of parameters of, uh, or a number of processes that, that occur in uh, natural uh, dynamics, which are uh, important uh, processes. I'll do it a couple times because I quite like it. Uh, which are important processes. We recognize they're important processes, such as uh, seismic generated landslides, and uh, in addition, there's a, uh, there are fluctuations in, in pore pressure, which we fluctuations in pore pressure. Oh, please. Ah, well, <laughs> fluctuations in pore pressure, which also uh, cause uh, sliding and, uh, and failure, and they're very difficult to handle within the present uh, scheme of our surface dynamics problems. That doesn't mean that they can't be handled, but the, it becomes increasingly ad hoc, sort of like a a, a British automobile of the 1960s with more and more things hung on to a rather attractive initial model, but by the time one gets it uh, well developed, it, it really uh, no longer uh, is the, I feel, is quite the correct way of handling many of these problems. So uh, the, uh, apologize, I really have given a PowerPoint before in my life. Okay, so let's go back. First of all, we're going to whip through the low frequency variations. And in this case, I'm taking a, a, a model of the Himalaya. So it's about a 2,000 kilometer model by uh, a 1,000 kilometer model by about 100 vertically, maybe a bit more than that. And these are the ones that I suggest are relatively standard. In this case, uh, the, um, in this, this particular region here, we're indenting India or running India into Tibet from the uh, left to the right. And these are the representative strain fields above. And I don't want to spend too much time on them, except to say that much of what we're dealing with in geodynamics is, of course, is a very large field. And we'll be looking at embedded models for the kinds of scales that we're interested in for the surface dynamics, and then feedback to the large models. In terms of the uh, just advection link, which is an important link, then it's quite a straightforward. Uh, uh, picture that is where there's advection, there's vertical displacement, then we get topography constructed, and so on. Uh, if we start to, uh, one way in which we can uh, couple the uh, geodynamics with the, uh, with the uh, surface models is by coupling it in with uh, rheological changes as a function of rapid removal of material. And one of the examples of this is the uh, tectonic aneurysm. The tectonic aneurysm model was developed really as a in response to these rapidly uplifted blocks, which as they rapidly uplift, they carry their temperature sign signature, but also their strength signature. They weaken the region. There's a nonlinear feedback between the weakening and the erosional scheme. It can produce very large mountains. And three examples, which we've discussed, 
are things like Naga Parbat, where the erosional regime is a focus river power, Nam Chabawa at the other side of the uh, uh, Himalayan chain, which is also focused river power, and another one that we've looked at more recently is St. Elias, where they're focusing is through a vicious glacial erosion. And that's a, a useful coupling, and it's something that we've talked about for a while, but one of the ones I'd like to look at now is the higher frequency one, in which strength is coupled to strain, that is to dis uh, displacements. And this is uh, not something that uh, is new, uh, certainly to those of us who uh, deal with faulting, and we recognize that a, a faulted region produces a, a gouge zone and weak zone, shatter zone associated with it. And the question that we're addressing is, what does this, how does this impact in the three-dimensional way on the evolution of the topography? So we'll take an example, which is from the channel, River Channel Fault in New Zealand, and the, uh, the picture of the fault is, looks like a this is, this is actual data here, by the way. Most of what I have won't be. Uh, so let's take a quick look at it. And the picture is a, a core zone with a fault gouge, very low, uh, that's a very low cohesion on the order of kilopascals, and then going into the megapascal schist on either side with a zone, a fault zone, which I think everybody is familiar with, but it's going to be important as we go on, uh, which is a, a decreasing uh, intensity of uh, uh, fractures as one gets further and further from the zone. If uh, erodibility is defined in most of the models in terms of an inverse function of cohesion, it's actually of the in, uh, one over the square of cohesion, then a change in cohesion makes a big difference. It makes a huge difference in terms of what we're going to see. And it also means that the orientation of these planes is hugely important. So here's a, a generic model that's been published off and on for some time now and represents pretty clearly the way we see many of these faults, although specific faults differ. Again, a weak core and strong edges. So the cohesion structure varies vastly in these systems from something which in a represented a more Coulomb space is down on the kilopascal level to something which is associated with the intact rock uh, on the order of several orders of magnitude different. And if we were to take a look at this, we'd see that rivers in general have this kind of strength, uh, where, and uh, the buttresses of Nagaparbat and other places have strength that exceeds that. So the difference is huge, particularly when we put it as a one over uh, C squared term. Well, what does it do to, the, uh, to their standard uh, model? And this is the same standard model that we had before. Except in this case, we're allowing the material, the earth surface material, to change its cohesion as a function of strain. So this little uh, video that we just uh, played and that I'll play again is, a, uh, is the result of a deformation field, a three-dimensional deformation field, which is imposed, uh, which is allowed to grow as a function of the strain uh, localization. So it's a strain softening, those you could think of as uh, fault zones. Those fault zones have a cohesion which is, uh, uh, which is on the order of orders of magnitude weaker than the intact material, and the erosional scheme is dominated, the river scheme is dominated by that. So uh, the net effect of this is that the, the strain field dominates the strength field, and it, uh, the orientation 3D is something that is represented in the topographic field. So at higher orders, when these are fully coupled together with a flat model, uh, uh, excuse me, a deformation model at, together with child, we get something that, uh, in which we can begin to see the relative importance of the various components as it evolves. And I'll play it again, because it's quite a nice one. And uh, in this case, what we're saying is to sort of pick this apart a little bit more. That is, so the strain and strength field are coupled. Consequently, this will be something in the memory of the topography, which is associated with effectively mantle kinematics. The, in the first case, there's the, uh, the elevation field. That gets superimposed by a developing cohesion field. And in this cohesion field, we see the stra strong bits are the high uh, peaks, and the weak bits are the valleys. And that uh, then Further, uh, if we put them both together, we begin to see that elevation and cohesion aren't always the same, but there is a relationship between the two, and it also controls the velocity field. So there's a complete feedback between the uh, strain weakening, which weakens both the erosional field and the, uh, and the material parameters, uh, the uh, finite element solutions for the, um, uh, for the deformation field. And clearly, it is, uh, it's necessary, as far as we're concerned, to be able to represent this in a three-dimensional way.
So uh, these patterns are very persistent. That is, the very strong regions uh, can exist for a very long time. The weak ones get eroded very, very quickly, which gives multiple, uh, multiple uh, characteristic times to an origin, and those characteristic times uh, give characteristic rates, which are very, very different. And an example of this is given by Sam, Sam Roy's uh, earlier work, in which he looks specifically at an uplifted block and the propagation of a, uh, in this case, of a, a, a nick point like behavior as a function of weakening. And the weakening occurs on these two fault zones, one which is dipping at 30 degrees, one which is dipping at 90 degrees. The weakening has the same kind of shape as the fault zones that we were looking at before, with a weak core and a more solid uh, edge. And if we run this, it's not too surprising. The, uh, the material outside of this, by the way, has no weakening. It's on the order of intact rock. And uh, I'll run it again. Uh, what Sam showed pretty clearly is that the rate of propagation is a function of certainly the weakening, but also the orientation of the weakening. So the fault zone that weakens very quickly and goes straight across as a strike-slip fault equivalent, whereas the other one is a dipping reverse fault equivalent in terms of the orientation of the strain plane. This is important in that the, uh, the propagation of the rates is therefore coupled to the, uh, the strain, the nature of the strain. So the nature of the strain uh, produce, uh, or the, the signal of the nature of the strain represents in the rates as well as the orientation. Sam has since taken this uh, uh, with us, and, and particularly help from Greg, has taken this, I think, in uh, somewhat further and began to look at what happens when a dipping fault moves across into a system by which we have a, uh, the whole landscape develops as a function of the uh, deforming region. And what uh, is quite clear is that the asymmetry associated with a dipping fault and erosion back along the fault plane produces a signal which again is characteristic, that is it, sits, it will sit in the topographic memory and allow us to unpack these, uh, unpack from the topography something about the memory in the future. So the intermediate conclusions of the strength-strain relationships are that first of all, valleys are weak and that the heterogeneity starts from the very beginning. It is as soon as the origin begins to form, heterogeneity is there. And from a modeling perspective, almost all of, probably all of us, but certainly all of the things that I've done in my, uh, uh, in my modeling life are to assume homogeneity to begin with. And it's a bad assumption on much of what we do. It's, we, we will still continue to do it uh, because it gets us started. But it almost always gives us a, a incorrect intuition from the beginning. And uh, I think that shows up particularly well. The strength of the should be its basic control in all origins, and it reduces uh, the complexity of the surface. That is, the increased complexity of the processes reduces the complexity of the remaining surface. It's one of the nice things about systems which could be fractal otherwise. And the 3D history is, uh, is a permanent memory, memory in that topography. But there's still a number of problems and opportunities that I'd like to go on about. And one is the specifically the uh, physics of the uh, of the mechanisms which actually allow the displacement and bringing together the two sets of theories for surface behavior and geodynamics behavior. So in this particular case, uh, what, we will, what I will try to do is look at the uh, 3D strength field and the 3D strength stress field particularly, and as examples, take a look at the New Zealand Southern Alps. This is a photo looking from the west to the east across the Alpine Fall. And we'll talk about this region to a little bit to begin with. One of the problems of talking about new theory is that by necessity we criticize or implicitly criticize old theory, which is not really my intention here. So I want to make it clear that uh, I'm responsible for some of this old theory so I can at least criticize myself on some of this. And that is one of the points that James made. He said that some of our results look like the uh, look actually like some of the observations. And therefore, we think that they're right. And in fact, this is something which has uh, got me a lot of free beer over the years, because it does look very, it is reminiscent of an origin in which we uh, produce uh, ridges and valleys, and it's produced predominantly by a diffusional mechanism and diffusional advection coupled together. It's been very useful. It will continue to be useful, but I think that we have to move beyond that, or I have to move beyond that, certainly. The case that I'm going to take a look at is the plate boundary of New Zealand, and I, the area is in the Mount Cook region. We'll take a look at two things, one which is a glaciated valley and one which is a badly slumped valley right on the fault there. <laughs> 
So the point about this is that uh, one, of the, uh, one of the standard uh, geomorphic surfaces that's examined are the iconic nick points, the nick point behavior. And the nick points are generally described, uh, often described uh, in terms of the relationship between the stresses which are generated at, from the fluvial system and the response of the earth. That is, there's a threshold. If it's overstepped, then material can be removed. In this particular case, we're looking up a, a valley from the, that I, the first one I pointed out, Franz Josef uh, Glacier, and we're looking at, the, uh, uh, at a nick point which sits right about at the edge of the, uh, of the valley. Fluvial stresses are represented by that little piece of principal stress space that sits down in the same orientation as the river. And this would be a fairly standard way of representing whether the stresses are going to be uh, overcome or not. In addition to that, though, there are also glacial stresses not too far away. And the glacial stresses also off operate on the same piece of rock, but they operate with a, a different set of, uh, of conditions, rho GH, uh, shear stresses, and so on. In addition, at the same place, there are also the slope stresses. And those slope stresses not only act in the direction of the glacier and the direction of the valley, but of course they also operate very strongly in the direction of the ridges, which is at right angles to the direction of the fluvial channel here. And those stresses can be very large, and they can be large enough to contribute to the tectonic behavior too. So there's already a coupling between te topography and tectonics through the stresses of the topography. But in fact, it gets a little more complex than that too. So if we take a look at this, we can see that, that the, uh, the stresses at the bottom of the slope are, are very crudely represented by a, 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 reverse, a, a reverse shear sense. At the top of the slope, they're represented by an extensional shear. And there's also tensile failure possible further up as well. In other words, one slope has multiple different stress states. It can't easily be represented in terms of a transport or failure in terms of a single value. And then we put on tectonic stresses. So again, that same poor piece of rock is also affected by the tectonic stresses. And then dynamic stresses, those of earthquakes. And that's really where I'm hoping to go today. So, uh, if we then look at this through time, that piece of rock is affected by all of those stresses plus the time-dependent or climate-dependent uh, glacial load on top. All of these happening at a particular place. So uh, in order to construct firm to deal with the fact that these various stresses are responsible for the, the failure, therefore, whether a threshold is uh, overcome or not, we reformulate the failure, all of those stresses, into a single Tensor referred to as the total stress tensor, and it has all of those components. And it's, this is uh, mathematically not a difficult thing to do, by the way. It just means that we put into a single reference frame, which isn't a river-based or glacier-based or slope-based, but rather a uh, geocentric base. We then look at the uh, earth failure in terms of the effective stress formulation, allowing fluid pressure solutions. This is something we normally do in geodynamics and engineering applications, so it's not hard. And we, apply, we allow a time-dependent strength material behavior. And then we solve in 3D. And uh, in this case, we use a, a, a constructed meshless method. And that meshless method is something which has, I think, great hope for the future. I'd like to talk to other groups about producing something here. But this one is not a sophisticated one particularly and doesn't have any, uh, any transport in it. So let's take a look, first of all, at the other system, which is that great big uh, a landslide, a landslide system, and Fedra has a poster on this that you can ask her questions about it later. If we take a look at a model from this, then that, whoop, excuse me, the, uh, the model here is one which is a topographic model, which then the stresses are solved for. And in this particular case, the cohesion fields are, come from measured cohesions in the region. And so we're looking up the valley across the Alpine Fault. Doesn't really matter too hugely at a three-dimensional model. And the representation here is red is relatively strong, blue is relatively weak. And the strength-stress relationship is such that uh, we're going to look at the evolution of that strength-stress relationship. James is eyeing me. So this is the strength-stress strength relationship and its evolution as a function of fluid pressure. If one takes a look at it, you can see that there's a, uh, the, uh, the weak region that is less than, than one migrates across the system as a function of changing the partial pressure of fluid pressure. We all know that, uh, uh, that landslides are a function of partial pressure, uh, the flu local fluid pressure and local fluid uh, Propagation. We can solve for that now. And in addition, this other one is another example in which we put on 
we take the same system, this happens to be dry, I didn't put the wet one here, but we look at the applied tectonic uh, strains at the, at the boundary and we look at the evolution of the failure system as a function of the application of those. And if you take a, if you remember the first animation and this one, you'll see that the blue marches at a very different way. As that blue marches, I don't know if you can see it in this slightly scruffy MPEG, but the topography is changing significantly and it changes differently as a function of the kind of input that we would, um, that we would put on. Well, there are ways in which we uh, can, I want to skip these because there's something else I want to get to that I particularly like. We can, because we now have the surface and the geodynamics in the same uh, same reference frame, we can solve uh, continuously for both and therefore we no longer have an ad hoc placement of one on the other. They're actually fully integrated system. There. But what I'm really interested in, <laughs> because I'm getting old and I'm interested in actually moving this thing forward fairly quickly, and I'd like to talk to you about is the dynamics and that is the thing that I find most exciting about this is that we have the opportunity to look at some of the older paleoseismology in terms of a rather new technique and use all of the information available in the topography. And that information is associated not just with a single scarp that may decay, but rather with every piece of, that, uh, of the topography that we can measure says something about its present history in terms of its stress state and its previous history in terms of acceleration and stress state. So one of the things that I'm particularly keen on is, and in fact is not particularly difficult, is looking at the response spectra of a single, uh, of any particular part of the Earth. This gives two regions, one in which is the response spectra of, of parts of New Zealand which are calculated, of course they're calculated for California and many other places, and that response spectra is a function of the it's a function of the period, and not only a function of the period, but also the nature of the earthquake. So strike slips, uh, faults at different uh, distances produce a different acceleration spectra than other faults. And, of course, they have a different spatial relationship. And the spatial relationship is also a good indicator of the spatial relationship of acceleration and the acceleration response spectra has a fantastic amount of information about the nature of tectonic geomorphic coupling at very high frequencies. Uh, so there we go, and we'll quickly look at one other example that we're doing. I'll go through very quickly, which is an ice sheet model applied to Alaska in which we couple the uh, presence and absence of, the, of an LGM load with a very high uh, uh, PRISM data set, and we look in this particular case at the position of the high-velocity ice streams, and we couple it to our three-dimensional geodynamic model. And these are some of the implications, and I think that it's... Uh, Time to finish for questions. Thank you. Hi, Peter. Hi, Rudy. Uh, this could be quite disconcerting to me, what you just said, because if we have a block of homogeneous material and then you apply a, a stress field to it, propagate strain weakening, let it interact with the surface processes, then the steady state solution can, has a lot of information in it that can get us back to what the stress field was and so on. But in real earth materials, with an inherited history of hundreds of millions of years, pre-existing faults and strains and so on, it seems to me what you're saying is we're screwed. <laughs> <clears throat> Because you comment on that. Yeah. Uh, uh, Rudy's asked me to comment on whether we're screwed or not with these. And in fact, my feeling is that we're less screwed with these than we are otherwise. That is, that these, the weakness zones and so on, are controlling variables. And I think that we can demonstrate that in a number of ways. So by not bringing them in, we are, uh, uh, we are making a very large mistake. But, the, but beyond that, I think that the, uh, the coupling through the firm approach allows us finally to look at the effect of the position of weak zones versus strong zones. For instance, in a river migration in valleys and, and ridges, if we suggest that the, the strength structure is only related to the one in the valley, then, and we apply the same physics and the same extrapolation to the ridges, we know the only thing we really know is that we have to have it wrong. And so in this case, this allows us to solve by a 
a way which is in which we can go out and measure things like cohesion, tensile strength, and so on. It allows us to solve and compare it directly to the uh, to the observations. So I appreciate the comment about the complexity, which I think is real, but I think this is a solution to it rather than the problem. Thanks. Yeah. You, uh, you noted that this approach can give us some solutions to things like poor fluid pressure landsliding that have traditionally given us trouble. Are there things in the surface processes that go the other way that you know you're modeling less than optimally by forcing it into this other framework? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I think that there are a number of things. Uh, I, one of the real strengths of the, uh, of the current process directed uh, regimes is that it allows us to look at integrated fluxes. And basically, it is an integrated flux if you use Q over a certain amount of time. Um, and this is not particularly good at that. But I don't, as I look increasingly at this uh, scheme, I think that this does not lose any of those of the capabilities. That is, if we can define the flow field, then we can calculate the stress field. In addition, the more we see about the, the really exciting hydrodynamics, where they produce a three-dimensional stress field, the more we see that we can immediately put it on here. So I don't, except for the fact that we're early on on this, I don't see an, uh, that there's any particular drawback other than my own clumsiness at bringing them together. Thanks.